Our, our general topic is revelation for the 21st century, uh, just probing a couple of issues and, and how you know, they might or could uh, impact uh, our, the Adventist interaction with, uh, with the rest of the world. Uh, so this one in particular, Revelation's remnant and the world religions. Um, it's interesting, as I mentioned in the write-up, uh, that historically evangelists have had three testing truths. Uh, in other words, they'd say the meetings would be going great until we got to these three, and then you'd see people dropping out, uh, et cetera. So they were the, the three most challenging doctrines of Adventism, you know, in, in the, the church that I was growing up in. And uh, those were the Sabbath, the state of the dead, and uh, the tithing. So uh, everybody's great with everything they're hearing until you get to one or all three of those, and then there are issues. Interestingly enough, moving into the so-called postmodern generation, those issues did not seem nearly so concerning. Um, you know, the response might be uh, something like that. Well, you know, Sabbath sounds like a good idea. I could use more of that. Or state of the dead, well, I had no idea. So that sounds as good as anything I've heard. Uh, when it comes to tithing, a bit more challenging, but still, hey, if there is a God and he cares about me, uh, it seems reasonable that uh, that I respond in, in some tangible way. So, so those issues seemed less uh, in the last 20, 30 years uh, than they were before. And the uh, remnant has sort of risen up to be the biggest challenge in many ways. Uh, the sense that it's kind of arrogant, self-serving to call yourself the remnant, uh, that has set people the wrong way uh, more than others. I suppose it first highlighted for me about 20 years ago, uh, we had a three foot fence between ourselves and the, and the neighbors and back. Uh, and uh, he and I were, were both working our gardens there within about 20 feet of each other, plain sight. And, and he just was, as he works, says, you know, you'll be interested in this, but I'm thinking of becoming a Seventh-day Adventist. And I said, how did this happen? And then he said, well, there's just one thing <laughs> holding me back. And I said, what's that? He said, the remnant. It's so arrogant. And so that was my first clue that, that maybe something uh, different was going on. And this uh, reached the attention of, uh, of the world church. And so uh, starting about 15, 17 years ago, uh, the uh, scholarly committee, BRICOM, Biblical Research Institute Committee, uh, began looking at the issue. Uh, and uh, they actually uh, ended up producing a book on the remnant. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But first of all, the key text uh, in Adventist understanding, and by the way, the concept of remnant is mentioned eight times in the book of Revelation. We only talk about one of those uh, generally. Uh, several of them are negative. There's a negative remnant, not just a positive one. And maybe that should be explored uh, a bit more. Uh, Leslie Pollard, president of Oakwood, did his dissertation on the remnant in the book of Revelation. So there's uh, a lot more work out there. But the text, the key text is the dragon was angry with the woman, went away to make war with the remnant of her seed, those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. So you see this word remnant, and uh, then comes the big question is, who are the remnant? And traditionally, uh, the Adventist answer has been the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That if you read Revelation rightly, and you come to this word, just fill in Seventh-day Adventist Church, and you have everything you need to know uh, about the end of time. Uh, obviously, that wasn't playing so well, starting in the 1990s. And uh, I remember 2004, getting a paper at BRICOM, this, uh, the Biblical Research Committee of the General Conference. And it was a paper on the remnant by uh, uh, a fellow that uh, I, I knew fairly well. And I 
took a walk and read the paper in preparation for the discussion, and I was absolutely blown away. I didn't agree with his conclusions because they didn't seem to follow from the evidence he presented, but the evidence he presented totally blew me out of the water. I had never seen anything like that, and it, it completely changed my whole perspective almost in an instant. And I came back to the committee all excited, and I said, this is one of the most significant papers we've ever had, and explained what I was seeing in the paper. And then the chair, uh, Angel Rodriguez, he said, well, he says, this, the odd thing about it is I brought a paper on the remnant. And uh, you've said everything I was planning to say in the paper, so I guess we don't need to read the paper now. <laughs> to which I said, well, by all means, now we double need to read your paper because I'm sure it went deeper. Anyway, that started a process that ended up in the production of this book. And uh, what does the... That's toward a theology of the remnant, that small writing above, uh, above remnant. Uh, so basically what I'm going to be doing in the first half of this presentation is giving you a summary of what the committee discovered. So I think this would be a consensus of what many of the church's top scholars uh, believe about the remnant today. And I don't hear it very much <laughs> going around uh, the church. So this hasn't really hit the radar. Uh, with the evangelists and 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 the everyday people in the Adventist church. So it might be useful for me to share it. And then the second half of my presentation, I'll talk about the topic, in what way could this remnant be relevant or uniquely relevant to a 21st century context? All right, so in the book of Revelation, who is the remnant? What is the identity of the remnant? And what I'm going to do in the next couple slides is share 13 items that we could spend an hour or two on each one of them. And in a, in a full class, a course on Revelation uh, would probably uh, do so. But we don't have time for that this morning, so you'll have to take it a little bit on faith that... Uh, I could uh, say a lot more about each of them. But as you look at the identity of the remnant, you see, first of all, it's at the end of Earth's history. However you read Revelation, it's clear that Revelation speaks to the time when John is writing, and it also projects the second coming of Jesus and events that surround that. So I think we could all agree uh, that whatever picture you have of Revelation, uh, it speaks to both of those things. And within Revelation's context, the Revelation 12, it runs from the time of John to the end. So as you get to the end part, that's where this remnant appears. Uh, it also seems related to the close of Daniel's time prophecies. Uh, Revelation 10 has probably the strongest allusion to the Old Testament in the entire book of Revelation. Revelation never quotes the Old Testament, but it alludes to it hundreds and hundreds of times. And this is the clearest of those allusions. So it's almost a quotation uh, in Revelation 10. So that's a, a significant piece of it. So when Daniel's time prophecies, however you understand that, when they come to an end, that's the time in history when this remnant would appear. They possess a prophetic visionary gift. Uh, there's a lot of discussion on, you know, what the testimony of Jesus is. Uh, I think I found some evidence in the book that takes that further uh, than uh, others have been talking about. Uh, and basically it's that this remnant, whoever that is, would possess a visionary gift like John's you know, something that sees uh, symbolic visions, et cetera. Uh, then this remnant would be the object of worldwide attention. And it would also have a message of worldwide significance. In other words, everybody would be talking about it, you know, CNN, Fox News, whatever. Uh, they're all talking about this message. So when you ask the question, is this the Seventh-day Adventist church? You see some echoes here that sound like it could be, but the last two certainly are challenging, aren't they? Uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church is certainly not uh, the object of worldwide attention. I think some would like it to be. Uh, and the message, you know, something that everybody's talking about, probably 
a little short of that. So that's uh, how Revelation presents remnant in the broad perspective. And then there's a series of ideas that are connected with this end time context. And again, we'll be going just very quickly. Uh, one is the gospel, and I have uh, texts associated with each of these so that uh, you know that uh, where it came from. Uh, it has something to do with the books of Daniel and Revelation. So the remnant will give the everlasting gospel, but in an end time context with attention to the messages of Daniel and Revelation. It'll have something to say about the heavenly sanctuary. It uh, will encourage the keeping of all God's commandments. It will offer a warning of end time deception. Uh, it will encourage relationship with Jesus. Would announce the hour of God's end time judgment. And would have something to say about the Sabbath. So you take a look at that and you say, does that sound like Adventist teaching? And I think most people would say, yes, it does. So the question is, how did that happen? Did Revelation predict what Adventists would be or did Adventists get it out of Revelation? I think historically the answer is, is pretty clear that the Adventist pioneers had the perception that the end time remnant uh, would serve God in these ways. And they said, we don't see anybody else doing that, so we better get on board. So to a large degree, Adventism, as we understand it, is based on a reading of the book of Revelation and sees this package of ideas as uh, a unique end time message that will be uniquely relevant at the end of time. So Seventh-day Adventists, sound a lot like the remnant uh, with some caveats, but part of that is simply because this is what Revelation was teaching and the pioneers of the church said, okay, uh, why don't we align ourselves with that? All right, so um, there's much more to be said and uh, that involves uh, going back to the Old Testament now. And as the committee studied these things, uh, they, they looked at how remnant terminology was used in the Old Testament. And uh, it, uh, in the larger context, there is a covenant with Abraham that was both universal and everlasting. He was to be a blessing to the nations. That's the universal part. And Israel would be a kingdom of priests. Exodus 19. So there's the idea that Abraham was not called for himself. He was called to represent God to the world, and so was Israel. So there was never a point at which the Old Testament was something just for Israel. Uh, it had a much larger purpose in mind, uh, according to texts like these. The goal would be the restoration of the Garden of Eden. And that's an interesting study that uh, if we had more time, we could do. But the call to Abraham in chapter 12 echoes the Genesis story in the fall and what happened after that and indicates that God is seeking to fix what went wrong uh, in the garden. So Israel's call was for the nations, but at no point in the Old Testament was that call ever fulfilled. Israel never reached out to the nations in the way that, uh, that the expectation was. In fact, you could say Israel completely failed to obtain the promise, the mess of the judges, the chaos. Uh, Solomon reached kind of a high point, but it didn't last long. Jeroboam, the nation splitting into two. Ahab. Uh, for the first time, actually promoting idolatry. Uh, Manasseh, uh, someone who sought to abolish the religion of Yahweh, not just mix it with pagan ideas, but abolish it. Then the captivity, and then the occupation after that. So the history of the Old Testament is a history of failure 
and disgrace. And uh, it simply did not carry out. No, as the, the Old Testament, as well, someone one called it, ends with a whimper rather than a bang. That everything that was promised there seems to have been a dud uh, when you get to the end of it. But within the Old Testament itself, there's the seeds of something beyond. And that is a remnant concept. God said, I will work through Israel to reach the nations. But when Israel failed, God reached out to a remnant and said, I will work through the remnant in order to reach the world. And the remnant, and this is for me the big breakthrough in that original paper, was that the remnant was a threefold concept. Never heard that before, but that in the Old Testament, remnant is three different things. It, at, at any point in the Old Testament, you had a remnant in the past, a remnant in the present, and a remnant in the future. So it's a time thing, past, present, future, three remnants. So first of all is a historical remnant, the past tense. Noah was a remnant of the flood, first reference to a remnant is in uh, Genesis 7. Abraham, a remnant from the 70 nations that followed after the flood. Israel was a remnant from Egyptian slavery. And later on, Israel would be a remnant returning from the conquest by Assyria. And here's a sample text. Uh, there's dozens of texts we could look at, but we won't. We're simply going to try to see the big picture here. Second Chronicles, O people of Israel, return to the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, that he may turn again to the remnant of you who have escaped from the hand of the kings of Assyria. So there's the remnant language. But historical remnants are not necessarily faithful. Notice in this case, Israel is not a faithful Israel. This is a call for Israel to return to Yahweh when they returned from, is, from Assyria. So uh, remnants in the past can be named, they can be counted, but they're not necessarily faithful. Being a historical remnant is nothing to brag about. There's nothing arrogant about that. It's simply a statement that God did something great in the past and we're still around. So uh, kind of reminding you of what God did in the past. Second remnant is a faithful remnant. And that's the present tense remnant. Out of a historical remnant, out of a visible remnant from the past, there would be some who were faithful. Some who were still uh, tracking on the mission and the message and the role that God had in mind uh, when the group was established. And this remnant, present remnant, is not visible. It's different from the historical remnant. Only God knows who is truly faithful and who is not. Great example is 1 Kings 19. Elijah says to God, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I, only am left. That word left is one of the Hebrew words for remnant. And they seek my life to take it away. So Elijah believes he's come to a point in history where within the historical remnant, there's only one faithful person, Elijah. God responds, yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. So here's an interesting piece. There's a prophet of God, inspired writer, who doesn't know that there's 6,999 other faithful people in the country. Fascinating. But the remnant is clearly not visible in the human sense. It is known only to God in the faithful uh, iteration. A third remnant is the eschatological remnant. And that's the future tense. 
And an example of that is Isaiah 66, verses 19 and 20. And I will set a sign among them, and from them I will send survivors to the nations. There's a remnant term. Survivors, that's kind of actually what the word remnant means, survivors. So survivors to the nations that have not heard my fame or seen my glory. All right, so what nations are we talking about here? Those who haven't heard about Yahweh have not any knowledge of Yahweh. So a remnant at some future time in Isaiah's picture, a remnant will go out to the nations that don't know God. And they, the remnant, will declare my glory among the nations that don't know God. And they will bring all your brothers from all the nations as an offering to the Lord, to my holy mountain, Jerusalem. Now, this is kind of exciting in a sense. You, you can imagine Isaiah's excitement to say, you know, things look a little dreary right now, but there's a big future. There's an amazing future. In fact, it's, it's bigger and surprising. It's more than Isaiah uh, might have expected. That God has a future remnant which will transcend the historical and the faithful remnants. Another text, a similar text in Isaiah. In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. The Assyrians will go to Egypt and the Egyptians to Assyria. The Egyptians and Assyrians will worship together. Now, that's a stunning concept in the ancient world. The Egyptians and the Assyrians hated each other. They had very different religions. And here's projecting the idea that they will worship together. That's startling in itself. But then verse 24, in that day, when they worship together, Israel will be the third, along with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing on the earth. Do you remember the blessing? So in Isaiah's vision, the promise to Abraham is extended to Egypt and Assyria. A mind-blowing concept within the Old Testament, an expansive view uh, that is not often seen. Verse 25, the Lord Almighty will bless them, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance. Amazing language. You rarely hear this text preached because we don't really know what to do with the text. But here's the idea in Isaiah's vision that something way bigger, unpredictable, uh, astounding is going to happen. So summarizing. Uh, the remnant in the Old Testament through Isaiah's eyes, at least. The historical remnant would be the Israel of the Exodus, the nation of Israel, visible, countable, etc. But the faithful remnant would be those within the historical remnant that are truly faithful in Babylon. But the eschatological remnant, from Isaiah's perspective, is the return from captivity. And that God would do some amazing things at that point to expand the influence of Israel. In the New Testament, Isaiah's language is applied to the church. That the church is the remnant, the eschatological remnant of Isaiah. And I think if we raised Isaiah from the dead and told him there were two billion people in the world reading his book and following Yahweh, he would probably say, I didn't see that coming. So the promise of a future remnant is bigger, more international, more surprising, unpredictable, wherever you go in the Old Testament. Moving quickly to the New Testament, the most uh, thorough addressing of the remnant issue is by Paul in Romans chapter 11. And he says the following, I ask then, has God rejected his people? What is he talking about? He's talking about Israel of the Exodus, the Jewish nation. Has God rejected this historical remnant? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Paul is convinced that God has not rejected the Jewish nation. Because 
He's a Jew who believes in Jesus. Do you not know that scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they've killed your prophets, demolished your altars. I alone am left and they seek my life. But God says, I've kept 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So, too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. So Paul says, Judaism is the historical remnant that reminds the world of what God did in the Exodus. And uh, the faithful remnant are those who follow Jesus. And if you continue Romans 11, we won't take the time this morning, but as you continue Romans 11, it's clear he has an expansive eschatological vision that one day uh, the Jews would return uh, and uh, come to follow Jesus and amazing things would happen at that point. So summarizing what Paul has to say, for him, the historical remnant is Old Testament Israel. For him, the faithful remnant are those Jews who follow Jesus. And the eschatological remnant is the end time church, which if Paul could know about it today, would be amazed at how it's in every nation, speaking of the Christian church is in every nation, two billion plus reading Paul's letters. Paul would be blown away by that information. So in this remnant concept, there's the idea of specific entities that God works with, but who have a limited value in the sense that they're a mixed bag between faithful and unfaithful. There are always some faithful people in those remnants, and God can use them for a way bigger, more exciting future. So we come to Revelation. And uh, Revelation 12, 17, again, the remnant there. The remnant of Revelation is also bigger and more international and more unpredictable. Revelation 14, 6, I saw another angel flying in mid heaven, having the everlasting gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. That's universal language. That the message of that remnant would have universal uh, implications. The whole world would be engaged by this. And uh, I think traditionally Adventists have thought that it's sort of a reform movement within Christianity. But this language, I think if, uh, if John were aware of our language today, he probably would have added every nation, tribe, language, people, and religion. So for Revelation, the historical remnant, I would argue is historic Adventism. Now you would say perhaps, whoa, isn't that a little bit arrogant? All right. I don't know what's going on here, but try to ignore the blue stuff. <laughs> um, historic Adventism is, uh, what I, is what I pointed out, all the package of ideas. I don't know of any other organization in the world, any other entity, institution in the world that teaches that package of ideas. The faithful remnant then would be those Adventists who truly grasp where God is heading and the eschatological remnant would be still ahead. But the idea is supported here that there's something way bigger, more international, more unpredictable, uh, still ahead. So summarizing, there's more than one remnant in scripture and history. There's no guarantee for historical remnants. Just because an entity is a historical remnant uh, doesn't mean it's faithful. Nothing to boast about. It's simply an entity who by its very existence, you know, Judaism to this day bears witness to the Exodus story, to the Sabbath, to the Old Testament as scripture. Uh, a lot more people know about these things because of Jews than because of Adventists. So, uh, historical remnants have value, and some would argue, well, shouldn't the remnant of Revelation be the Lutheran Church? And I say, well, but if the Lutheran Church 
is not teaching the package of ideas. I was involved in dialogue with the Lutheran World Federation and uh, revelation is not a major interest uh, of theirs. But I would see the Lutheran church as a historical remnant of the Reformation. The Catholic and Orthodox churches are historical remnants of the New Testament. More people know about Jesus and the cross because of Catholicism than Adventism. It's simply a fact. An entity may or may not be faithful, but its very existence still bears witness for God. That's what I see in Romans 11, where Paul says, God has not rejected the Jewish nation. Uh, they may not all be faithful, that's between them and God, but God still can work through an entity that's flawed. But the biblical study is there's something way bigger coming. Now, let me stop here just for a moment and say this is where the book, you know, the committee and all of that uh, would come thus far. And from here on, I'm on my own. Okay. Uh, so what, we, what we're going to do beyond here is what we're specifically doing this for. And uh, you can believe it or not, it, uh, I don't think it has any general endorsement, but I think there's implications in this biblical study of the remnant uh, for where we are today and what kind of relevance revelation could have in the 21st century. What I'd like to do in the rest of our time is a quick look at Christian history. Uh, and history can be a boring topic, but I don't think this will be, simply because today, historians are sounding more and more like the book Great Controversy. Interesting. Um, the book Great Controversy and Uriah Smith and so on tended to base their history on marginal historians or on footnotes in works that might otherwise go in a different direction. But today, some of the top historians in the world are talking more like the book Great Controversy, which is fascinating. And, and where might that lead us? I'd like to introduce you to three of them all of whom I know personally. Uh, James Dunn is probably the world's leading historian of first century Christianity. In other words, what Christianity was like in the first century at the time when the New Testament was written. And he wrote a book called The Partings of the Ways between Christianity and Judaism and their significance for the character of Christianity. Notice that word character that when Jews and Christians split, Dunn argues, the character of Christianity was forever changed. It was never quite the same after that. So he argues that originally Christianity was a Jewish sect. It emerged from within Judaism. They worshiped the same God. They read the same Bible. They worshiped in the same temple. They were essentially one people. But toward the end of the first century, the parting of the ways began. And uh, it was uh, started in the first century and probably was completed by around 135, uh, 100 years uh, after the time of Jesus. And the way Dunn presents it, it's almost as if Jews and Christians sat around a table and negotiated the divorce. Because uh, as Dunn points out, the problem is when religions divide, they both lose something. Both Judaism and Christianity lost something when they split apart. It's as if the Jews said to the Christians, you know, we love the Messiah. But whenever we talk about the Messiah, people think we're Christians and we can't have that. So you keep the Messiah. And uh, the Christians said to the Jews, well, we love uh, the Old Testament. But whenever we talk about the Old Testament, uh, people think that we're Jews. We can't have that. So you, you keep the Old Testament. And the Jews said to the Christians, you know, we love eschatology and stuff. Whenever we talk about eschatology, the Romans come and beat us upside the head. So you keep that. And in the Babylonian Talmud, 35 volumes, there's one page of eschatology. That's how, what happened to Judaism at the turn of the first century. 
the Christian said to the Jews, well, we love the Sabbath, but whenever we keep the Sabbath, people think we're Jews. We can't have that. So you keep the Sabbath. In, in the parting of the ways, both religions became somewhat less than what they were before. So we come to a second historian, Bart Ehrman. By the way, Dunn is a British evangelical, not a Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, Bart Ehrman is certainly not a Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, he doesn't even claim to be a Christian. Uh, but he wrote, uh, he's probably the world's leading historian of the early centuries, second, third, fourth century Christianity. And he wrote a fascinating book called Lost Christianities, The Battles for Scripture and the Faith We Never Knew. Uh, Ehrman makes the case that there were five or six versions of early Christianity that uh, Christianity was not a monolithic thing in the first couple of centuries. Only one of these five or six versions exists today. What we would call Orthodox Christianity, the, the great tradition of Christianity, was a particular branch of Christianity. The other five or so were very different in many ways. Jesus' family was not Orthodox. So the people who knew Jesus best at the beginning ended up in a different direction than where Christianity is today. Each of these five or six versions of early Christianity could be supported by the New Testament. So the New Testament was a document that was more open-ended. Uh, it, it allowed people, uh, allowed a certain tension, uh, allowed uh, for some diversity of viewpoint. All of this continued into a fellow named Constantine, and Constantine wanted to unite the empire. And his mother, apparently, uh, who became a committed Christian, uh, convinced him that the best way to unite the empire is for him to become a Christian and for him to make the empire Christian. And that way it would be united. But when uh, Constantine became aware of the tremendous diversity, he said, this is not going to help. And so he basically set the, the trend of getting rid of all versions except the standard accepted version of Christianity and getting rid of the other ones. And so from that time on, everyone is either an Orthodox Christian or is in opposition to it. But the earlier branches of Christianity did not survive the fourth century and the fifth century. So Jewish Christianity was one of those branches that did not survive. And Ehrman points out, they were accepted by Jesus' family. They kept the Sabbath. They emphasized obedience. And they emphasized the importance of the Old Testament for Christian faith. And Ehrman says, when, when Christianity cut out Jewish Christianity, they lost these things. And oddly enough, Ehrman, though he's not committed himself, laments these losses. He said Christianity could have been more diverse, broader, more positive in the world if they hadn't gotten rid of some of those early options. The parting of the ways with Judaism changed Christianity forever. As a result, Christians today have narrow and selective readings of the New Testament. You, know, you don't want to pay attention to the parts of the New Testament that don't fit the Orthodox uh, standard. This general ignorance of the Old Testament among Christians. And Christianity's decline precipitated Islam. Islam might never have happened if Christianity had been a bit more diverse in Arabia, uh, for example. So that triggered my thinking. What's going on when Islam began? And I have a few passages from the Quran to share with you. Uh, these are, are recollections of things that Muhammad taught when, uh, when he was alive. And they're very surprising. Uh, most Christians had no idea. Most Muslims probably have no idea what I'm about to share with you. But these are right from the, uh, the book that is at the heart of Islamic faith. And it's clear that Muhammad never came to start a new religion. His mission was to reunite Judaism and Christianity and, and to reform them 
to to be up to where God was working in his day. Uh, for example, in this text here, it says, say ye, we believe in Allah and the revelation given to us and to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, and Jacob, and the descendants of Jacob, and that given to Moses and Jesus, and that given to all prophets from their Lord. We make no difference between one and another of them, and we bow to Allah. So the Quran does not consider Jesus or Moses to be inferior to Muhammad, but that God was revealing himself in stages uh, through all those historical eras. A similar passage, prophets of Judaism and Christianity be respected as equals. Those who deny Allah and his messengers, those who wish to separate Allah from his messengers, saying we believe in some but reject others, they are in truth unbelievers. In other words, if you're a Muslim and you reject Jesus, you're an unbeliever. Pretty stunning. To those who believe in Allah and his messengers, plural, and make no distinction between any of the messengers, we shall soon give their due rewards. For Allah is oft forgiving and most merciful. So the prophets of Judaism and Christianity are considered equals. The scriptures of Judaism and Christianity are normative for the Muslim. Again, not widely understood in either Judy, in either Christianity or Islam. It is Allah who sent down to these step by step in truth, the book. What's the book? That would be the revelations in this context that Muhammad was receiving, confirming what went before it. So the revelations to Muhammad were to confirm what went before it, what went before it. He, God, sent down the law of Moses and the gospel of Jesus before this as a guide to mankind. Pretty stunning stuff. If you are in doubt as to what we have revealed unto you, then ask those who have been reading the book from before thee. Here the word the book means God's revelations throughout history. There have been others before Muhammad that read the same book and he could consult them, namely the Jews and the Christians, if he didn't understand what God was saying to him. The truth has indeed come to you from your Lord, so be in no wise of those in doubt. And then finally, Judaism and Christianity are valid expressions of Islam. Say to the people of the book, that's Jews and Christians, and to those who are unlearned about Islam, do you not also submit yourselves? The word submit is in Arabic, the word for Islam. Don't you become Muslims? If they do, they're in right guidance. But if they turn back, thy duty is to convey the message and in Allah's sight are all his servants. So Judaism and Christianity do not need to be converted, but they are already Muslims in God's sight, even if they don't you know, consciously embrace the institution, if you will. Had not Allah checked one set of people by means of another, there would have been pulled down monasteries, churches, synagogues, and mosques in which the name of Allah is commemorated in abundant measure. In other words, the God of Islam is worshiped not only in mosques, but in monasteries, churches, and synagogues. So Islam seems to have originally been a vision for reuniting the monotheistic religions uh, and making them relevant for the seventh and eighth centuries. It failed, this mission, even within the lifetime of Muhammad, there was the, the massacre of Medina that you may know something about in which uh, the uh, possibility of Jews and Muslims getting along was forever ended. And uh, Islam ended up becoming a third monotheistic religion. Uh, and whenever religions break apart, historians say they both 
lose something. In this case, three religions have lost something. Now, traditionally, when Adventists talk about Judaism and Islam, they ask the question, what's wrong with these religions? But one day I had a crazy idea. Why don't we ask the question, what's right with these religions? And uh, when I posed that question to Christianity, what, what is there about Christianity that's a core value, but Judaism and Islam rejects? And uh, the answer I came up with was gospel, grace, and Jesus not widely accepted within Judaism and Islam. For Judaism, it would be law, obedience, Sabbath. And for Islam, it would be submission, judgment, eschatology. Many Adventists don't know that Islam is an eschatological religion, that it has the same core question as Adventism. What is it? you know that truly matters at the end when you come to the end of the world at the end of your life what will prove to truly matter and the islamic answer is god and good works the adventist answer is character the one thing you take with into eternity so um, both islam and adventism are eschatological religions but christianity generally is not so here you see the uh, the uh, parting of the ways resulted in a hardening against each other, surrounding certain core principles uh, from which the others are rejected. One more historian, and then we'll start heading to a close here. Philip Jenkins is an Anglican uh, scholar, and he's, I think, the world's leading authority on contemporary Christianity written some amazing books uh, on that subject and he wrote one of these books was the next christendom here he describes the geographical movement of christendom through the last 2000 years it starts as an eastern religion in the middle east but then the center of gravity moves to europe first to rome and then to northern europe and in our time, the center of gravity of Christianity has moved more to North America as the place where it has its, uh, its strongest base. But that too is changing. That Christianity as a whole is moving south and east. In a sense, returning to its roots as an Eastern religion. And uh, so, uh, he made the startling statement that uh, the Anglican Church, by the year 2050, the majority of its members would be in the Southern Hemisphere and the Eastern Hemisphere. And I remember raising my hand at a conference where we were both speaking and saying, you know, if you had written your book about Adventists instead of Anglicans, you could have written it 25 years sooner. And he laughed and <laughs> acknowledged that Adventists were way ahead on that same trend of becoming a Southern and Eastern religion. And he was asked, what book of the Bible do you think would be best suited to keep Christianity together as it, uh, it, it stretches South and East? And he gave an interesting response. And that response was, focus on the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is something that's very, very popular in the South and in the East. And if we in the West pay more attention to it, we might see the key to keeping Christianity together in the, as we approach the end of time. Well, that idea seemed an interesting one for me to follow up on. And so I came back to the book of Revelation. You've seen this before, but this is the message of the remnant in the book of Revelation. The gospel, a focus on Daniel and Revelation, eschatology, the sanctuary, keeping all the commandments of God, warning of end time deception, relationship with Jesus, hour of judgment, Sabbath. And so I took a good look at that and then began to remember that chart 
of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. By the way, I've shared that in interface contexts where we had an equal number of Christians, Jews, and Muslims, and nobody objected to the core values that I placed on each one of them. So I think it has some, uh, some uh, validity uh, to it. But do you see what I'm seeing? Do you see what I saw? When you go back to these core values, it seems to me that the remnant of revelation has all the core values of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Now, if that is true, if that is true, and if God has anything to do with Adventism, then evidently, Adventism is uniquely placed to connect with the other religions outside of Christianity. In fact, I think Adventism probably is more comfortable with Judaism and Islam than with Christianity, because the gospel has been a real challenge for us. So uh, the surprising thing, perhaps, uh, for most of you might be, in what way does Adventism have anything to say to Islam? And that brings me back to my time living in the Middle East, in the uh, Arab section of Jerusalem, the Palestinian section of Jerusalem, for a number of months uh, with my family. And one day, I was riding jump seat in a tourist bus where our group was, uh, uh, was going to see some sites, and the driver was a Palestinian Muslim. And all day, we were interacting in different ways, and finally, Heading up that road to Jerusalem at the end of the day, he took a weird look at me and he said, you're an American, aren't you? I said, yeah. He says, how come you're not a Christian? And I was absolutely floored. What do you mean I'm not a Christian? I was defensive, you know. What do you mean I'm not a Christian? Of course I'm a Christian. He laughs and looks at me. He says, I know lots of Christians. He says, you're no Christian. I was completely blown apart. This is crazy, you know? And it happened over and over again. And I said, what is going on? And then I realized that in the Middle East, everybody knows who's a Christian and who's a Muslim. They know them, first of all, through alcohol. If you go to a grocery store and it sells alcohol, you know it's a Jewish or a Christian store. If there's no alcohol, it's a Muslim store. Well, where do Adventists fit? Um, pork. Christians in the Middle East uh, make a big deal of the fact that they can eat pork and, and Muslims can't and Jews can't. Well, where do Adventists fit? Modesty. If you go into a travel agency in the Middle East and the women look like Vogue magazine, there's uh, probably a Jewish or a Christian travel agency. Uh, if they're dressed more modestly, it's a Muslim one. You ask them what they think of the papacy, and the Christians in the Middle East will be very positive, and the Muslims rather negative. You talk about America, and the same thing happens. Christians tend to be positive. Muslims tend to be negative. Uh, Muslims tend to be very serious about their lives, how they live, obedience, etc. So you start looking at this, and you begin to realize perhaps Adventism was designed not to have the barriers towards some other face that, uh, that Christianity generally does. I was uh, sobered today learning uh, that uh, John Dibdahl, a good friend of mine, a uh, longtime missionary, died uh, recently. And uh, he once told me, from his experience in Italy and not Italy, India and Southeast Asia, he said Adventism tends to be more like the indigenous religion in those countries than like Christianity in those countries. So he would extend this even further, not just Judaism and Islam, but all the non Christian religions tend to relate to Adventism easier than to other Christian faiths. And so that suggests to me that this may not be an accident, that revelation casts a package of ideas that has potential relevance 
uh, beyond that of Christianity as a whole in the times in which we live. Because I think most people today would say the greatest need of the world today is reconciliation among the religions. Nearly every war that's fought is fought on the basis of religion. You say, well, uh, Russians and Ukrainians are both Orthodox. Yeah, but the Ukrainian Orthodox Church is an offshoot of the Russian Orthodox Church. And getting them back in line was one of the motivations of Vladimir Putin. He's very plain, plain about that. Uh, so most of the wars that are fought are fought on the basis of religion. If religions can talk to each other, can find common ground, that may be the greatest need of the world today. So the remnant of revelation seems to point the way to ideas that can be a common ground for all uh, the religions of the world. So closing thoughts, to be an Adventist is both and, to be bearers of a vital and unique message for the world, a divine calling in history, but no reason for boasting or arrogance. Historical remnants are a mess. We start pointing to the church and saying, that's you know the great thing of God. Church is a tool. And that tool can work well and sometimes not so well. As we noted last time, one reason a lot of people leave the Adventist church is the way they've been treated in local churches. So there's, there's no perfection going on here. No reason for boasting or arrogance. At the same time, if the Adventist message tracks with the message of revelation, there may be something there that is worth preserving. And it suggests that something bigger, surprising is coming. And in my last note, the interesting thing about it is I'm discovering that just at the very time when some of us are catching a vision that Adventism could have greater relevance than it has in the past. Adventists themselves seem to be buying into the political stuff of hating Muslims and, and outsiders and stuff like that. And it was just when our message begins to look really inviting to others, we ourselves are closing down and not wanting to engage them. Uh, interestingly enough, not long ago, Loma Linda changed its seal. Uh, it used to have on its seal a broken sword uh, you know, from Isaiah, they'll break their swords, put them into plowshares, healing rather than war. But the decision was suggested that we replace the broken sword with a cross. And I protested that decision. It's not going to make you look good. But I, I nevertheless said, look, I said, there are places in the world where the cross sends the wrong message. To a Muslim, when they see the cross, they think Catholic. Is that the message we want to portray? Adventists have never highlighted the cross as a symbol uh, in all of its history until now. I lost. <laughs> and so you look at the seal today and there's a cross on there. And, uh, you know, in terms of our work outside uh, the Western world, I'm, I'm not sure uh, what kind of impact it has. So anyway, these are significant issues, uh, I think, relevant today. And I am open to your uh, questions and feedback.